All righty. Um, like 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have you out of here. All Easy right, peasy. Sure. That's a, it, it always starts like that. Oh, yeah, 15, oh, it's 20 15 minutes. minutes and an hour, like, hour later. Right. No, no, no. It's going to fly. Like, the thing is, is that you have so much fun talking to us that you don't even realize exactly. how much That's time. That's what I'm saying. It's going to be an hour later, and we're going to be like, Same. oh, okay. <laughs> I do feel bad that we left you out of this twin situation. I know. Mm. Sorry. So rude. So rude. What is up, everybody? Welcome on into the call up from our AT&T 5G virtual studios. I'm Susanna Collins. That is Jillian Sakovitz. We have a jam-packed show today. So much to talk about. We have Mo Adu on the show, y'all. All right. This is a former MLSer. He's a 2007 MLS Rookie of the Year, 46 caps with the U.S. Men's National Team. And now he is a broadcaster for pretty much every single soccer broadcast and network that you can imagine. The guy is everywhere. He is on Fox. He is on CBS. He is on Bally Sports working with Jill and Kevin Egan on the Atlanta United broadcast. He is everywhere. And on top of that, He's also adding movie producer to his list. So we are going to have a, a really incredible conversation with him about all of the things that he is involved in right now. We're also going to hit on Ted Lasso winning big at the Emmy Awards. We can now say that uh, the call-up has interviewed an Emmy winner. And that is pretty cool, um, to say the least. And also we are going to have a little moment of silence for... Um, one of our one of our own Luchi Gonzalez. This is all all to come. It's a very it's an emotional roller coaster of an episode, everyone. So I just want to prepare you ahead of time for what's to come. <laughs> you know, you mentioned emotion, Sue. And uh, first off, I, I, I you know I just have to say it's so fun to have um, Mo do on. He's really just become like a really great coworker, just like you and and a dear dear friend. So it's kind of fun to kind of bring some of those conversations that we kind of have when we're sitting mm -hmm. in between commercial breaks uh, to the show or, you know, housing double cheeseburgers like we do from time to time yeah, at Bar Margo. Shout out Bar Margo in Atlanta. Uh, you mentioned emotional, though, and emotions in general. And I learned a very valuable lesson this week. Well, do tell. <laughs> so you know that, you know, throughout quarantine, I took two Spanish classes, been working on it. Joseph Martinez has been trolling me since September of 2019 that I need to ask him questions in Spanish. And mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is Joseph Martinez is just a more talented human being than I am. The guy speaks like five languages, including <laughs> German, a little Portuguese, English, Spanish. Yeah, no, he just, he kind of is. Well, I mean, in the uh, soccer uh, yeah. sense. Um, but you know what? It was just <laughs> all, it was all the feels midweek when Atlanta beat uh, Cincinnati and, uh, I knew I owed Joseph an interview in Spanish. So I'm like, you know what, Jill? Do the questions. Stop being such a baby. Just ask him the questions and you'll tell him. All right, Joseph, mm -hmm. I'll ask the questions in Spanish. You'll answer in English. Well, I did it. And I was so scared. And Suzanne, it was a really humbling experience for me. For oh, a few God. Reasons. Because I got the TV freezies. Remember when you first started and you'd go to ask your question and all of a sudden oh, you and would then your see... mind goes blank. Yeah, and you see black. Yeah. And I haven't just played an entire game. I've been standing yeah. there um, with full oxygen levels, and I got the TV freezies again. So it was a humbling experience, <laughs> and I have to say, I couldn't even sleep after after it because, like, it was a late game. Whatever you do, it you think nothing of it, and you're like, all right, well, that just died with the rest of any you know Wednesday night MLS highlights, and now life will go on. I had horrible anxiety the night before. And then I got really positive feedback the next day on, on Twitter. People being really nice. You know, no one was saying that my Spanish was perfect. But everyone just being happy that I put myself out there. So the message is, put yourself out there. Yep. You'll be scared. You won't sleep. But you'll be better for it. And it was humbling because I, I got a little insight into what it's like for so many of our players that don't speak English and after mm -hmm. playing 90 minutes, still go out there and maybe don't do it perfectly, but they put themselves out there and they try to connect. So it was a, it was a humbling, a humbling week for me to uh, get the TV freezies again and, and just a lesson learned that. And you know what? You're going to get made fun of, too. But you put yourself out there and, and you do it and you try to you try to see what other people are, are dealing with. Yeah, 100 percent. Good for you. I think it's uh, I think it's a really, really good exercise and just kind of challenging yourself, you know. And like you said, you don't know unless you put yourself unless you put yourself out there, put yourself in those uncomfortable positions. Um, and you're there's always growth after it I'm in getting some sick way just thinking about shape it right or now. form now did you did you practice did you write it down like how did you like like because i i would 
I speak a little bit of French, but like if I were to yeah, interview someone and like I like I would I I think it would just completely go away. Like I would just so I would have to have it like in front of me. So I did. I wrote it down. Yeah. But you know what the hardest part is, Suze, is you know exactly what you want to say. Yeah. Um, but you have like maybe five minutes on the sideline to quickly <laughs> jot it down and yeah. write it down. And, you know, you might take classes and you can write it down. The hardest part is just in that moment when it's so loud of like calming yourself down to say what you know you can say. And I had to say like a few few sentences. And then it just mm-hmm. gave me just such a larger appreciation that I already had for guys like Joseph and other guys who who – Blurt out sentences upon yeah. sentences, and it's so loud. You're so tired that just a humbling moment. Well like I done. Said, yes, I, I wrote them down. Well so done. Well put done. Put yourself out Proud there. Of if you're you. nervous about something, Proud of do you. it. Because overwhelmingly, people will support you, and some people will make fun of you. But you know what? It's kind of good to be made eh. fun of once in a while, too. Yeah, you know what? It's exactly. It's good for Those the humbling soul. moments. Those humbling moments. Oh, good stuff, Jill. Way to go. Um, also, guys, as you can see, we are twinsies. Once again, if you're watching this, we are wearing these amazing Kick Childhood Cancer uh, training jerseys that every team is rocking and selling right now. I've got on LAFC. Jill is rocking Atlanta United, of course. Um, but you can still buy these on the MLS store and again guys if you tweet using that hashtag kick childhood cancer every single tweet continental tire is going to donate a dollar to the children's oncology group so it's an incredible cause just you know get get busy on twitter use that hashtag it's through the end of september so you still have some time to do it and uh, actually these jerseys are just really pretty cool they're my i love this i know i actually love these We look good. Yellow is our color, after all. A very big, exciting day. Time now for our AT&T 5G call to the field. 46 appearances with the U.S. Men's National Team. Three times Scottish Premier League winner with Rangers. And 2007 MLS Rookie of the Year. And my colleague at Atlanta United, Maurice Adu. Maurice, wait, I thought we were calling him Moo. (laughs) Are we calling him? I was, I was just going to say, I don't Boom. know who Maurice is, but then you threw a moo in there, too. Okay. All right. Well, oh God. as as Moo knows, um, <laughs> every time I've called him that, Atlanta United's had a non-losing game. So I think we're in for a non-losing podcast here today. Mo, let's get the elephant out of the room so we can ha- uh, really get into it on this show. The question, is Atlanta United back? <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> how do you How do you not say they are? The... I mean, it's the results, but then it's also the way that they're playing, right? It's the way that they're getting the results. I think that's what's what the fans expect. They expect them to win games, but they expect them to do it in a way that's attractive football, the flair, and and you, we, you, Kevin Egan calls him Bam, right? And the Bam right now is producing, right? Joseph is what one goal away, I think now from a hundred. The Marcelino Moreno has been, mm. I think, probably the most consistent player over the course of the season for them so far. Barco, since he came back from the Olympics, has been ridiculous. And then, of course, Araujo has come in. And, you know, small sample size, but already he just looks like he's well worth the money. It's so I think sometimes we've seen in this league, it's it takes DPs a little bit of a while to settle and find their feet and then come into form. I mean, this guy's look he's looked exciting and dynamic since the first time he stepped on the pitch for them so far. Crazy it's true. It's winners, true. winners of the seven of their last eight. Is that correct? It's just wild. Um, the Susanna turnaround is all up on her. Oh, you guys, I, 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 I also <laughs> host a bunch of other MLS things. So I am in tune with the entire league y'all. Um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Mo, is because we have seen this incredible turnaround from Atlanta. When you first started, this is your first year with the Atlanta gig. Did you feel a little bit like maybe you were like, what am I stepping into? Am I bad luck? Like, what is going on? Like, what has been your journey like? Like, from from the team not doing well to where they are now, this incredible turnaround. What's it been like for you? Well, well, Kevin, Jill, they said I was a jinx. You know, they said <laughs> I brought I brought all the bad juju. I brought all the bad <gasps> luck. And no, I mean, it, it's it's coming into the season. Of course, I was excited um, from a few different reasons, right? Obviously, knowing Atlanta, what the team has accomplished so far, knowing um, the city, being I spent some time in Atlanta a little bit before, and then knowing the crew that I was going to be working with, I was excited. There was just so many good pieces that, that were coming together at the right time, and so I was excited walking into the scenario. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> the results just started going a little bit less, and I was like, wait, hold on, am I the jinx? 
<laughs> but you know, I give a lot of credit to I give a lot of credit to the players, of course, the fans for sticking by the team, and then you have to you have to look above all that. Whether that's that's Carlos, that's Darren Eels, that's that's uh, Arthur Blank, recognizing that this isn't what we signed up for. This isn't what we. This isn't the standard that we've held this club to in their short tenure so far. Made the change, and you know, even before Gonzalo Pineda comes in, Rob Valentino has a team turning around. So I've I've gone through a whirlwind of emotions, <laughs> uh, but I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it, and I knew things would come get to this point eventually. So now that it's here, I'm just enjoying every game. The stadium's incredible. Being there. Um, and just witnessing that atmosphere on a consistent basis, being around the city and seeing how how in tune with the team everyone really is in that city is incredible. And this is this is soccer in America now. You know, this is what the standard is. So uh, it's been great. I've enjoyed it. All right, Mo, you mentioned Carlos Bocanegra, and I'm always in awe over how, some of the people that you've been connected with throughout your playing career and then have come back into your life. And Carlos Bocanegra is a big one. If I have my info correct, his dad was your your math teacher growing up yeah. in Cali. Okay. <laughs> then you guys just casually go to a World Cup together in 2010. Now he's the <laughs> vice president and technical director of one of the teams that you work for. So let's talk about that. You grew up in North, in California, got Nigerian parents. You're one of five children, come from a family of educators. How did you get into soccer and also soccer at such a serious level? Like, what was that conversation like? Uh, well, one thing you left out that me and Carlos were also teammates at Rangers, too. So we the oh, journey yeah, yeah, just yeah. has been, yeah, it's intertwined everywhere. Oh my God. How did I come Crazy. into soccer? Uh, well, I came into soccer because, as you said, my parents are both Nigerian, right? So for as long as I can remember, there's been a ball around the house that I was kicking or was being kicked at me or was just I was interacting in some capacity. And, and I grew up watching games with my dad on TV. We, you know, I, funny story. So. Back then, um, I guess there weren't as many games on TV, and the ones that were on TV, we didn't have the channels to watch them. Uh, and my dad, he coached the team, he coached Arsenal um, over here in California. So one of the players on his team, himself and his dad, would always record Arsenal games and bring them to the training. So me and my dad would come home and watch Arsenal. So that's how I grew up becoming an Arsenal fan. Oh, so that no. was like, yeah, 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 it's been a rough, it's been a rough, <laughs> sorry, rough spell for us. It's, I'd like to say that we're getting. Bad, we're not okay anyway so that was like my first introduction to soccer was just that was my my dad's love um and so he just passed that down to me and i got introduced with i think i started playing organized maybe around like four or five ish and just just took off from there that's what i always wanted to do i played other sports growing up but i didn't take anything as serious and i think the only one that i actually played like properly organized and consistently with soccer and it just went from there, just from team to team, started off with AYSO, then you get into like your traveling teams, playing club and ODP, which I don't think is even around anymore. And all those kind of programs, youth national teams. And then it just, every step you start thinking, okay, maybe this can become a little bit more real. And I had some young, when I was, um, I think around 16 or 17, 15, 16, some of my teammates went into residency, guys that I played club with. So I'm thinking like, okay. I play with these guys every week. I train with them, play with them on the weekend. I know I'm at their level, if not better. So if they're getting opportunities, then why am I not? So that was kind of like motivation for me. Then some of them turned pro earlier than I did. More motivation. And the thing that it I became from personal that, to you, didn't it? <laughs> it got a little bit personal. You know? That's why I took it personal. <laughs> no, but it, it was honestly like motivation for me. And I fortunate I had parents that kind of kept me grounded and also kept my perspective focused on my own lane because... It's so easy to get distracted and think and feel like you could take that, you could channel that in two ways. One as motivation or one like start feeling sorry for yourself. And luckily I had family that was like, nah, just keep your feet on the ground, keep working, your, your chances will come. And fortunately for me, they did. It's a, you've had an incredible soccer journey um, from University of Maryland to the being the 2007 MLS Rookie of the Year. Your face was on the cover of FIFA. How did young Mo deal with all the hype that kind of surrounded you? Because um, you burst on the scene. Um, and, and that can be a lot for, for a, young, a young player. How did, how did you stay grounded? Was it your family that you mentioned? You know, how did you kind of keep things in perspective at that stage of your life? Yeah, I think a big part of it was my family. They're my biggest fans and my harshest critics. Uh, as Jill said, I'm from a family of five, right? So I got three older sisters, a younger brother, uh, and then my parents, of course. So, And they were all super in tune with soccer. This is a soccer family. They all played soccer. Um, 
we when we were young, my dad would take us to the park and all of us would train together and all that kind of stuff. So it's like a proper soccer family. So as much as they were quick to, you know, congratulate me and celebrate certain <laughs> moments, they were also quick to be like, hey, nah, you're not coming in here thinking you've got a big head. That's not happening. So it was impossible for me to 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 buy, to read too much into it, to to start thinking I was more than I was and any of that kind of stuff. Of course, that stuff does happen. You know, you get little accolades here and there and people recognize you around town. It's it's easy to, to fall victim to that. And I'm not going to say that it didn't happen to me. But luckily, I was able to bounce back or have people who slapped me and kept me in place. And but I enjoyed it, man. It's, it's when you're a kid, that's what you dream of. You dream Heck of all yeah. those all those moments, the good, the bad, all of it. it. It's part and parcel of of being a pro. And I wanted all of it. I wanted to I wanted to have the great moments. And then, you know, the bad moments are good stories to tell now. Right. So you live and you learn and you experience it. And I was fortunate that I got that opportunity. See, that's what the well, podcast I was gonna is ask for. You then, yeah, that's, I was going to ask you, like. What's your best moment? But you know what, Mo, on that note, um, you know, for some of our fans listening who aren't as familiar maybe with your careers, you began and ended your career in MLS with Toronto to start, with Philadelphia to end, and in between you had an incredible international career, including Rangers, where we mentioned three Scottish Premier League titles. Give us one of those bad stories, please, along the way. Just a funny story that made it seem so funny at the time, but now (laughs) we can all just laugh about it right here. Um... Well, this isn't a bad story, but it's just like, so when I was at Rangers, it was cool because there was always another, at least one other American there with me. And um, <laughs> so initially it was me and Bees, DeMarcus Beasley. And then I can't remember who came first, Carlos or, or Bedoya. But anyway, they we all ended up being there at different times. When Bedoya was there, we used to just, just pranks all the time, right? <laughs> whether it was like, whether it was us two, like, collabing and pranking the rest of our teammates or if it was me doing something sly to him him doing vice versa so uh and i don't know if this is even out there or if i ever told him this but obviously ranger Celtic, a huge rivalry huge rivalry and and like you get into it with with opposing fans fans heckle you in the streets they it, it can it can get aggressive at times yada 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 so uh but oh, yeah. <laughs> I went to his house, uh, me and one of my other teammates, we went to his house and it was like late at night and we egged his car. I can't remember what he did to me first, but we egged his car. What? Egged his car, put like, yeah, put like flour on his car. Like, oh, that's so mean. And, but he wakes up the next day and he's like, oh man, like Celtic fans got me. And he like, I think he might've <laughs> called the cops or called like the, the team liaisons. And they like, it was, it was a big deal. And he thought like it was Celtic fans. And I, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't remember if I ever actually told him that it wasn't. It was us. So, I mean, it might just be getting out here now. So we're breaking well, news right now test. for Bedoya. The test. The Does Alejandro stories? Bedoya listen to the call up? We'll find out. The other stories, I'm trying to think of what I can actually <laughs> say on here. Um, you can say it, whatever you want, Mo. This is a safe yeah, space. It is a safe space. It's a space. safe space, but it's also a, a family-friendly space. Okay, let's talk about your uh, let's talk a little bit about your career with the U.S. Men's National Team. Forty six caps for the national team. Um, you were a twenty four year old at that twenty ten World Cup on a squad that just had so many legends and names. Yourself, Landon Donovan, Tim Howard, Clint Dempsey, Carlos Bocanegra. I mean, just the list goes on and on. When you think about, and I know that right now you are you are so in tune with the U.S. men's national team as they are right now. When you think about the experience that you had with the U.S. men's national team and you look at what the dynamic is right now, what what are the big differences for you between a group like what you had and what we are now seeing on this current roster? The biggest difference for me and something that I've been just like harping on since this team took over the mantle of the U.S. men's national team is just the transition period, right? Like when I... When I came into the national team and even that twenty four or twenty ten team that you were just talking about, there were so many veteran guys already on the team, right? So my first camp, I remember it was like there was like seven of us young guys who kind of came into camp and the rest of the team was already guys who had either played in World Cups, played in Gold Cups, won Gold Cups, just experienced. And so pretty much positions nine or one to nine are already in ink. And then it's like two spots that everyone else is competing for. Whereas you look at this team now and you're welcoming in 11 fresh faces to, to assume the national team, right? So there was never, there wasn't much of a a transition period where young guys had a chance to come in and just be young guys, to learn the ropes, to have the older guys take them and take them aside and say, hey, 
This is what it means to be a part of the national team. This is what it means whenever you put on this kit. This is what it means to, to, to walk out and be wearing the United States jersey to represent your country. Whereas, you know, I was fortunate that I got that. There wasn't as much pressure on me in the, in the beginning stages because, you know, you're welcome into the team as a young guy. You're just looked at as a role player who could potentially, who could potentially be more. But the onus at that point is on Landon. It's on Clint, it's on, you know, Carlos, it's on Gooch, it's on Beats, it's on all the pressures all on those guys. Whereas now the pressure's on these young faces from the get go. And to be honest, I think they've handled it well. It was never gonna be easy. There was gonna be growing pains and there's still gonna be more growing pains, but they believe in themselves, which goes a long way. They seem to be a really tight knit group. Obviously the talent level is incredible. Um, I think the talent level surpasses what we've seen from from most teams, from our team, we had a good team. But like when you think about the the individuals on this team, there's some really good pieces. So I think they've come together maybe quicker than than I thought they might have. Um, and although what they're sitting in third right now and qualifying, it's still early days. And I'm still really bullish about this group. I think they're going to be they're going to do well in qualifying. And ultimately, if not this World Cup, if this group stays together and matures the right way, well, well it's on home soil. All right, let's go. I'm happy. I'm I'm be excited at that point too. Heck, heck, yes. And something else you have to point out about Moadu that we're always talking about behind the scenes is the fact that it is not talked about enough that this guy calls U.S. Uh, games and is talking about the U.S. men's national team for pretty much every network on the planet. <laughs> CBS, Fox. What the How heck, many Mo? jobs do you have? <laughs> I, the grind never stops, right? I'm 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 just hustling right now and reps. They always talk about reps, the importance of reps. So I'm getting. <laughs> I'm getting hella reps right now, just trying to make sure that, you know, I continue to grow and progress and it's fun. I enjoy it. Um, Post-career, post-career, you try to find something that's gives you the same kind of feeling as playing. And for me right now, this is it. I, you know, like I said, the different people that I've had the, the pleasure and the, and the honor of working alongside Jill and Kev in Atlanta and the different cast at Fox. And then obviously um, a lot of former teammates when I'm with CBS. So it's just been really good environments that I've enjoyed mm-hmm. that have, push me and challenge me and hopefully is also making me better. Well, the perfect segue then into our next topic, which is that Mo, I know you made what's always the really difficult decision to retire at 32 after a series of just unfortunate, um, unfair injuries. And you got, you jumped right into broadcasting. How long, what was it between your retirement and, and broadcasting for you? What was the time? Yeah. How much time was between that, that you stopped playing Honestly, and went into broadcasting? It was pretty quick, and part of that is Shaw. You, I think you both know Shaw Brown. Um, Shaw had been in my ear. Like I'd done a couple of shows when I was still playing. Like I think a Rangers game, come in, like done some studio stuff for a Rangers game um, when it was on Fox. So I had my feet wet a little bit, but not much at all. And then I'd also been in the booth with Philly when I was injured a couple of times. But again, I was a third man in the booth, so I was just chiming in with, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, <laughs> like that kind of stuff, right? So – my experience level was nothing, but Shaw was in my ear like, hey, I think you would be really good at this. Um, you know, I don't know if it was an interview that I did when I was younger that kind of just stuck with him or Shaw, Shaw is Shaw. And he was the one who kind of pushed me a little bit saying like, all right, look, you're, what are you doing right now? You retired, right? You have some free time. Why don't you come in and at least give it a try? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know, Shaw. In my mind, when I was a kid, this is off topic real quick, but when I was a kid and thinking about if someone asked me, what did you want to be when you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm-hmm. Soccer player or movie star? So I wanted to be in front of a camera, but I thought I was going to be like, a, <laughs> you know, a, in a TV show or in movies or that kind of stuff. So Shaw's like, hey, why don't you give it a try? And I was like, all right, you know what? I had some free time. Like, let me try, let me try it out. And the first time I did it, I was like, oh, that was whack. I suck. Like this, this, this thing. I enjoyed it, but I was like, yeah, I suck. And he was just like, ah, just keep, you know, do a couple more practice shows or practice um, games and did a few more, started to get a little bit more comfortable. And then fortunately, the first show that I ever did was with uh, with Rob and Stu. So I knew Stu, obviously, it's one of my boys, one of my teammates, former teammates. And then I was I knew Rob not as well, but I think that helped to make it a little bit more comfortable. Uh, and then just got the itch for it. Just really enjoyed it. And like I said, just the being able to still get back to the game and being close to the game and speaking about the game. There's just so many things that I enjoy and appreciate about it. And then the ability also to like motivate that next generation, because I didn't grow up seeing or hearing voices like mine. So I never thought about, I never thought about doing this job. So hopefully now I'm 
not just myself, but myself and others and young kids grow up and they see that this could be a possibility for them. I love that. And Mo, I have to give you so much credit because it isn't easy. You know, it's, it's, it, it is a, a skill and a talent that requires a lot of reps, as you said. And I think it was, it was when I first started MLS, you came and did some stuff for uh, the playoffs with us in around like 2016, yeah. 20. And I was blown away, but I was like, Mo Adu is really good. Like he's really, really good. And I know this was like still very early on in your uh, sort of broadcasting foray, but you were you, the way you broke down plays and you made it so understandable and digestible for audiences. And you've maintained that and have only gotten better. And I just want to say you're one of my favorite analysts out there and you have done such a remarkable job in a short period of time because it ain't easy. Oh, and uh, people I appreciate should, that. People should know that. Um, okay, so as as we mentioned, you, you're a part of three, three different broadcast crews, um, which is just crazy. And there are some big personalities that you are working with. So we're going to do a little, a little game here. We want you to describe some of your, uh, your colleagues, your, your TV counterparts in just <laughs> one word, just one word. Um, okay. So we're going to start with the Fox crew. Okay. So the first one that's up is John Strong. One word for John Strong. One word, okay. John Strong would be, uh, and and um, for lack of better, John's the same age as me, but old. <laughs> so my one word would be, but but see, I have to give you, I have to give you a little bit, I have to give you a little bit, a little bit, right? Like one word, and then I'll a ex- little bit of the explanation, right? I say that because John's like an old soul. Like when I talk to John, I feel like this man has lived this life before. Like he's, <laughs> we're the same age, but this man is just like, you get the sense that he's just wise beyond his years. So it's like old is like more of a compliment. Wise. Than it is a negative. Sage. Yes. Senior. Yes. There you Senior. go. John's so going to hate us. From old to wise. Old from, instead of old, wise. I say John is never suspect. coming on this podcast. That's amazing. Oh, he, you no, know. going to hate me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> John's <laughs> joked about it too. I've heard him say things like, "You'd never guess me and Stu Holden are the same age." And yeah, it's true. Like you almost feel like there's 50 years between 100%. John and Stu. Yeah, in both, he's just in a, both he's directions. more mature. I should have said mature. That's a better word. Like me and Stu are kids, and, and John is just like he's very, very like seasoned and mature. Uh-huh. So that the Fox crew, um, John Strong. For the sake of time, we'll move on to the CBS crew. How would you describe the CBS crew? All in all, the you know, this is like the newer, the new kids on the block that's burst onto the scene. It's you alongside Kate Abdo, Gooch, uh, Clint Dempsey, and Charlie Davies. How would you describe <laughs> the whole crew? The whole crew? Uh, I mean, fun. We, we, this, so as much as we take it serious and it's a job and we, we want to be, um, make sure that we're we're analyzing things and giving and educating the viewers, we also enjoy each other's company, right? And, it's not like I've been in situations before where, you know, off camera, it's great. And it's like, ah, then this camera comes on. And it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I feel like over there, it's the same. The camera just never stops rolling. It's how I feel like over there. Right. We just we genuinely enjoy each other's company. Like I said, we're most of us we're, we're former teammates. And then Kate's just she's incredible what she does. And she she's kind of hones us all in when we stray <laughs> and go off topic and off on random tangents, she's like the media, hey, all right, let's come back to reality. But it's just, it's an enjoyable environment. The banter is flowing. And um, who would have thought that you would have a collection of former teammates all in one place? It's awesome. It, it has been such a fun watch um, because I, I know you all individually and I know that you guys are so tight. And to kind of watch that friendship that I've seen outside, off the camera, to be on camera. It's just, it, I literally feel like I'm just like sitting in a bar with y'all watching soccer with some of these discussions and it's such a great vibe and I love it. So much fun. Um, okay. What about your Atlanta crew, your Atlanta colleagues, Kev and Jill? I get to ask this am question. I, no pressure. No pressure. How would we just, describe am I, them? Is it just for one of them or just the whole crew? Or for Let's both? do both. Let's do both. We can do both just as a whole. I would say, okay, Jill's <laughs> on here now. Let's. Um, if I had to categorize them both under one word, I would say. I would say this is going to sound corny, but I would say positive, right? 
Oh, and and I say that because, no, I say that because when I first came, when I, you know, the news was kind of like circling, like, oh, it's going to come. Jill straight away, like, called me, like, hey, you know, what do you need? Like, let me answer questions for you. Let me like, like super welcoming Kev, the same thing. Um, when things weren't going the greatest with the results <laughs> for Atlanta, right? And I'm over here like ah, losing my mind. Like, this is what, what's going on. Jill, <laughs> positive, still positive. Like, hey, well, blah, 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 blah. Kev, Kev comes in and he's just... He has these random days where he comes in and he's just, just bubbly, just super Joe, am I lying? Where he's just like, or like, Kev, are you okay? Like, relax. Like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> like, just over enthusiastic about, oh my God, this is going to be great. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, all right, yeah, it's going to be fun, but can you relax a little bit? So honestly, I, I could probably use similar words across the board because one thing that's been consistent across all the different networks I work with is... You know, everyone's been really welcoming. Um, the environments are different in their own ways, but then also ones that that I enjoy being a part of that that challenge me in different ways. Kevin Jill, are, I feel like we're in the same mindset of like we're we're all hungry. We're all we're trying to prove a point. We all, you know, this is this is kind of we're very hands on in in this in that setup, and that's something that I that has been fun and it's been enjoyable. Um, and then, you know, the other, like I already talked about the other two, but yeah, I, I have a lot of respect and appreciation for the way that they welcomed me in. I know it could have been an easy transition with Dan leaving at, you know, at the last minute, the way that that, ha that all played out and then having to welcome a new face. And so I, I'm, I'm always grateful to, to both of them and the way that they've just made me feel like a part of the family from day one. So it's, I look forward to these Atlanta trips. It's been good. That was lovely. That was so <laughs> lovely. Gave me all the feels. Um, it's just like me and you, Suze. Just I, that's, that's just the soccer world just for you. Vibes. And I didn't disclose that we that probably what keeps us going is we eat a lot of cheeseburgers. We pretty much have a <laughs> <laughs> um, post game for, cheeseburgers for sure. That's right. Heck yeah, that's right. Um, Mo, to just echo what you're saying, I mean, I couldn't have imagined welcoming in a, a better coworker. So we're just so thrilled um, to have you. You mentioned, though, Mo, wanting to be a movie star when you were younger. And that's something we still talk about of that. Yeah, you're in soccer TV and all this, but like it's sky's the limit for you. And you've started to dabble your feet already in the Hollywood business. You teamed up with casual name drops <laughs> here. Common, Josie Altador, Charlie Davies and Demarcus Beasley. Um, to create the movie that's going to come out at some point, Rising Above. It's about the 1971 Howard University soccer team um, when they had their NCAA title wrongfully stripped away. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and why you wanted to tell it? And I know it has extra meaning um, for you, just the whole storyline. Yeah, I mean, initially it came across my radar. Um, one of my friends, he he went to college with the writer and me and him, he's actually, um, he actually used to work for Fox. He's a PR guy, Brian Strong. You guys probably know him, actually. And me and him had just had conversations, same conversations like we're having now, where I just, maybe I'm just trying to speak things into existence, right? So anyone I talk to, I'm like, yeah, I want to I want to be in movies. I want to test the waters. And we had had those kind of conversations. And fortunately, uh, a bit of opportunity came his way. And he was like, hey, let me see if Mo has any interest. And when I heard about the story, um, of course, initial, the, my initial reaction is it's a story about about faces that look like mine within the soccer landscape. So, of course, that, that that's that's an easy win, easy sell for me. I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm interested. But then beyond that, the storyline is is deeper. There's more complexities to it that that really resonated with me even more. Right. The the conversations that are going to be introduced about, you know, identifying as black and the different complexities that go with that, whether you're deemed African American or you're more or you're or you're foreign black, whether that's being from African country or the Caribbean and just the dynamics that that exists um, and the struggles that go along with that. So obviously there's the everything that you just talked about, Jill, with the team winning the winning the championship, having it stripped away, um, being able to to regroup and galvanize themselves and come back and win the championship a couple of years later. That's an incredible, inspiring story. But um, I'm just excited. I think it's going to be if for those who don't know the storyline already, who don't know about the Howard soccer team, it's a quick read. It's 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 an inspiring story. And just being able to bring that to the screen and introduce, you know, certain characters like the coach Lincoln Phillips, his story is going to be, I think, through the lens of him and his unique journey and the way that 
that he navigated coaching that team when he was a young a young kid himself, basically, and also a foreigner and uh, of Trinidad descent. It's just an incredible story. And then to, to team up with guys like Common and Peter Lawson as the producers, it's, I mean, who, who would have thought? I definitely didn't <laughs> think that was going to be a possibility. And so to find myself in this situation. Um, and then, of course, when I told when I told Josie, when I told Gooch, when I told Bees and and Charlie about it, of course, they all were like, yeah, yeah, like this, this needs to be told. This needs to be heard. The timing of it is, is unfortunately, it, it makes sense, you know, given the current climate of things in the last couple of years. It definitely is a story that I think um, is timely and, and is going to be impactful. It's a, an incredible story. Um, and one, if you guys uh, haven't checked out, there is an episode of the movement that Kalen Carr did a couple years ago. Um, and he actually interviews Lincoln Phillips. And it's really, really good if you want some background on this. But we cannot wait, cannot wait for this movie to be told, for this uh, story to be told. And Mo, we're so happy and proud that uh, you're taking that on. In addition to all of the many, many things that you do and all the hats you wear. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. We want to give a quick shout out to your beautiful little boy, Bryson, and your lovely oh, fiance. Where is he? Bryson! Is he here? Is Bry Are we going to get a Bryson yes. cameo? <gasps> yes. Give me one second. Give me one second. I'm surprised Stop. he hasn't been here yet. There he you say is. Hi. hi, buddy. Hi, Bryson. Oh my gosh! He's on world now. He just he's woke up. He's a star. Up, just ate. Oh, he's in a good place. Go, got a nap in. Yeah, got some food go, in. That's when I'm at my best. You don't want to say hi, you, Bryson. You don't want to say hi. Hmm? Hi, buddy. You see your wave, Bryson. Time now for here for this, and I will tell you, we could not be more here for Ted Lasso just winning big, big at the Emmys over the weekend. Absolutely incredible. Not only did the show win Best Comedy, but we saw Best Actor statues go to um, <gasps> Hannah Waddingham, who happens to be a, a call-up alumni. I'm just saying that that is one of the coolest things ever. Um, we can, Jill, we can say that we have interviewed an Emmy winner, which, you know, hey, put that in our back pocket. Um, and she you was, know what I just thought she was of? flawless. What? Mo being admittedly that he'd like to burst into the Hollywood scene. We didn't have to bribe him to come on. I but know. Had we had to, we, we could have, we could have, we could have given him the hard sound been like, actually, you know, that we, we too have connections in Hollywood now. Well, and first comes call-up <laughs> appearance. Next obviously, comes obviously. But she was spectacular. Her speech was incredible. Yeah. Um, and Jason Sudeikis also takes home the Best Actor trophy for his role, and he created this this character of Ted Lasso. But but here here is where things get a little interesting. Okay, so U.S. Soccer Twitter is always it is such a uh, volatile. A volatile place. It's a spicy place. People freak out. I mean, it's just, it, it, you're all in, you're all out, you're angry, you're happy. It's just, Ooh. it really is, uh, it, it's just a lot. It's a lot. So Roger Bennett from Men in Blazers, as we all know him, um, he tweeted out something immediately following Jason Sudeikis' win that literally had U.S. soccer Twitter in a tizzy. And I'm going to read this tweet right now, okay? So here is what he said. He said, Jason Sudeikis wins Emmy for lead actor in comedy series. Hard to exaggerate what Ted Lasso has done for the profile of men's football in the United States. Our <laughs> women have won World Cup after World Cup, but few American men have done more for the game than Jason and his team. Okay. So if you are familiar with Men in Blazers and Roger Bennett in particular, I mean, this guy, satire is his middle name, okay? It is just, it's all tongue in cheek. So I read this and I, I actually saw it and in real bait. time. Clickbait. Clickbait, exactly. And I, and I just kind of chuckled. I'm like, this is so typical. This is so on brand for him to tweet something kind of like so outrageous. Well, U.S. soccer Twitter went freaking nuts. This is a disgrace. The worst tweet. Deadspin wrote an article about how this was the worst tweet ever composed. I mean, people were losing their minds. You're disrespecting Wando. You're disrespecting Landon. You're disrespecting the U.S. women's national team. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, it's a joke. Calm down, everyone. Go to a comedy show. 
also here for this is great now this is just a tremendous thing that Wait, happened speak in a british accent though because yes. maybe okay. we really can make it happen right so this is my um audition for ted lasso if you would like mm-hmm. me to uh you know be part of the show i'm more than happy all right so jim curtain very good susanna jim curtain see look at you look at you okay. oh that's fabulous all right jim curtain i can't do it now forget it jim curtain guys jim curtain head coach philadelphia union all right, suffered um, a, a tough loss uh, midweek to um, Club America in Champions League, okay? So once again, MLS is not in Champions League. They've been eliminated. Wah, bust out wah. your want want bust out your violins. But Jim Curtin is such an outstanding human being that he gave a ride to two stranded fans. It was a mom and a daughter, Club America fans, mind you that were stranded. They needed to get back to their hotel. They didn't have a ride. And if you have ever been to Chester, Pennsylvania, it's kind of like not, it, there's not a lot of traffic around. Like, it's not like you can just like hail a cab or like yeah. get an Uber. Like um, you're kind of out there. Exactly. The so, and you know, you're, you are sort of stranded unless you have some sort of means of, of transportation. And Jim Curtin gave a ride to this woman and her daughter, Club America fans, after a loss. And I was just like, you are a wonderful guy. What a wonderful guy. I just love that. I thought that was such a, a nice little feel good, especially after suffering a loss. You know, guy's probably not in the best Jim, mood. What a guy. All you got to do now is, is, uh, is actually coach a game in that sweatshirt that we sent you. That <laughs> call up on it, And then you're really an untouchable for us. Last but not least... <laughs> Um, this is really just more like a, you better be here for this because it was my idea. But I was sitting around on a casual Sunday night, giggling to myself about Mm -hmm. some random defensive lineman during an NFL game saying that he's from like Weston elementary school. And I'm cracking up. I'm like, why do these get me every time? You know, it's coming. Some NFL player says, "Ah, I'm from this elementary school, or they say something annoying like the Ohio State University, and you just laugh, and I laugh so much. And then I thought, okay, everyone, these are huge superstars, everyone knows who they are, everyone's heard of Auburn, Ohio State, where those little, like, intros would serve best would be Major League Soccer. So Mm. I started a petition on Twitter. Um, I'm not really sure how, like... Yeah, what kind of traction are we getting? Um, Okay, so I'm going to say it's pretty official at this point. Okay. 704 likes, 49 retweets, 37 comments. To me, in okay. MLS world, that's pretty much like that's a, a lot. Signed, yeah, that's a signed petition of that. We need those intros in MLS because, as broadcasters, Susanna, you and I both know that you can call a communications department in the league, and you're like, so how do you say this guy's name? I want from the horse's mouth. How the heck you say your name? And you know what? I want a little flavor. <sighs> I want a little world pizzazz of knowing yeah. where you're from. Like I want to hear you say your name. And I want to hear you tell me where you're from. And then, you know what? We might get, like, some funny stuff. Like, maybe you'll shout out your elementary school in Brazil. Who knows? But I want to bring the ML- the NFL intros to MLS, and I just want you to be here for it. That's all. Now, I, I'm definitely here for this. Now, you're talking about, like, you in the broadcast. No in the broadcast, right? Like, yeah. So, like, so yes. bottom of the screen, their little yes. head pops and up. Little and, p- it and, says, they, and it's them, and yeah. they're like, Susanna Collins. Joseph Martinez. University of Venezuela. Illinois. Yeah. Jillian Sakovitz, SUNY Oneonta, <laughs> also, also the home of Don Garber. <laughs> Last but not least, I would like to have a moment of silence for a man who's done a lot for FC Dallas on a very serious note, uh, the playoffs in the last two years and also the Academy. Uh, but most importantly, the inaugural winner of our Best Dressed Award, and we even named it after him. We did. Farewell the- to Luchi Gonzalez, uh, the inaugural <sighs> winner of the Golden Hanger Luchi Gonzalez Best Dressed MLS Coach Award. I'll tell you one thing, Jill. MLS just got a, lo- a lot less stylish. This was actually shocking. Obviously, we appreciate Luchi for, for his attire, and we did give him our inaugural Golden Hanger it's Award. It's named but after him. I know, but man, this one We're was just... We're not going to change that, This right? one took me... This, no, absolutely not. The, his legacy shall live on via the call-up, as it, as it should. He, this is, he is an important figure. Um, and also, I just, you know, I want to say that some of the comments were there were people that were like Susanna Collins is going to be very upset at this when they posted this and I saw it in the comments and I was like oh, yeah they're not wrong what is on tap well the second edition of League's Cup comes to a head tomorrow night September 22nd as the Sounders face on Leon at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas want to go to that mm-hmm. still time 
Uh, that game is at 10 o'clock Eastern on ESPN2, Unimas, and 2DNA. Uh, yeah, that's actually, I mean, this is, it's going to be, it's going to be fun because as we said, that stadium is uh, ridiculous and the Sounders have made it very known that they want some more hardware. So I'm excited. Woo-hoo! I'm excited to see it. Um, also, speaking of League's Cup, earlier today, a, a huge expansion announcement about this tournament. So starting in 2023, MLS and Liga MX will participate in an annual, every single year, y'all, that's what it means, month-long summer tournament. Um, and it's going to feature all clubs from MLS and Liga MX. They're, so they're going to pause their respective seasons within the league throughout that duration of the tournament. So literally, it's going to be like a little break, and then this League's Cup tournament is going to to happen. Um, so this is going to be sanctioned by CONCACAF. It'll consist of a group stage followed by knockout stages with the tournament champion earning automatic qualification for the CCL round of 16. So that's actually huge, huge incentive for clubs. Um, the clubs that finish second and third will qualify for the opening round of CCL. So if you win this thing, you're automatically in the group of 16, which is wild. Um, but yeah, this is a, a big, big development. For more information on this, head on over to MLSsoccer.com for the full deets. Big things happening with League's Cup. Woo! But if you don't want to wait till 2023, <laughs> you've got some other stuff to look forward to. There is MLS versus League MX action heading our way. Campione's Cup is back next Wednesday on September 29th. The Columbus crew are going to welcome Cruz Azul to Lower.com Field, uh, their brand new stadium. That game is going to take place at 8 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN2, Univision, and 2 DNA. Campeones Cup. Um, and after the match, make sure you join Andrew Weeby, Matt Doyle, Kaylin Carr, and Cesar Hernandez as they break down all the action uh, for League's Cup tomorrow and Campeones Cup next Wednesday. So go over to Twitter Spaces. Well, they will be hanging out pregame. Um, and then after the game, all MLS platforms um, will be having their postgame reaction show. It's going to be good. So, yeah. Lots to look forward to this week. This week is nuts. It's crazy. It's also the first official week of fall, I think, right? Ooh, yeah, Isn't it tomorrow? I know. I know. Sue's like, Nyeh. I know. I know. But uh, you know what? I, I like fall. I, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready. I'm not. Are we? You know what we didn't tease, though? What? We got a heck of a guest next week. Get oh! ready for that. I forgot. Just get. I, we, I don't want people. to jinx it. I don't want to jinx it. I just like, like, I just. Oh, no, figured, it's happening. Like, like it's. It, it has been this guest has agreed to come on like I have it in writing. They're coming on. So I just fingers crossed that this actually happens because I think this is going to be one of the most interesting, fun, crazy shows yet. Teaser. We'll say Teaser. Deutschland. <laughs> Giddy up. Giddy up. Guys, thanks for watching, listening. Enjoy the rest of your week. What's up, everybody? It is Susanna Collins and Jillian Sackovitz, co-hosts of The Call-Up. And if you want more Call-Up action, hit like and subscribe right here on YouTube, right there. And also make sure that you download every episode of The Call-Up every single Tuesday at 5 o'clock Eastern Time or anywhere that you get your podcasts. And while you're here, why not check out some of these other videos as well?